And now we come to the portion of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to move and lead and guide among us. Um, as we were praying this morning before service started, we had this thought that, you know, Lord, we're asking for you to come near. Now we know that the Holy Spirit is already here. So what we're, what we're asking is that our hearts would be aware of the work that the Spirit is doing, that we cooperate with that work. So let's pray together, and we'll close that by reciting together um, from Psalm 19 in our bulletin. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, you are described in the Bible as Ruach, as the breath of God. We'd ask that you would breathe new life into us today. And here's the truth of it. We live in kind of a dusty town. The wind blows and dust gets everywhere. How it gets through closed windows, I do not know. But sure enough, we live in a dusty town. And Lord, I know that sometimes my heart gets a little dusty. And so Holy Spirit, we want you to, to come in and, and not only breathe new life into us, but blow off the dust that is within us. Get rid of the grit. Let it just fall by the wayside so that we could experience sweet fellowship with you. Spirit, please teach us what Jesus would teach us if he were here about the Father. If there's anything that's merely human in this time, we pray that that would be forgotten and only that which is from you would remain. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> The dust is definitely getting to me. <clears throat> when I was growing up, do you, Heidi, remember the, the lithographs of all of the uniforms of the army that Dad had all the way back from the founding of the army in 1775 all the way up through, I think, 1962, probably when he bought the, the set. I still have those. One of these days, I'm thinking I'm going to frame all of those and I'm going to hang them up. I'm pretty sure that my dad probably thought the same thing. So, Belle, it's on, on you, kid, wherever you are. <clears throat> when the United States became a nation, they formed an army, and that army trained together. They learned tools for survival in hostile environments. The, the army has been training soldiers ever since. God has called us together and has been encouraging us to undergo training in godliness as well. And sometimes it's very structured, like it is in the military, and sometimes it's much more you learn as you go. The old phrase, you learn something new every day, to which I always add, if you're paying attention. So today, we're going to see if we can pay attention to some truths for godly training. These are basic training truths for us to hold on to in times of conflict. And we're going to look in Philippians chapter 3 for this. Love the book of Philippians. I've talked about this, so I won't keep going. Uh, if you will turn with me in your Bibles to page 1828, Philippians chapter 3. We'll start with the second half of verse 4. Philippians 3 verse 4. Paul writes, If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. 
But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. We'll stop right there. Truth for godly training. The first one is that excellence isn't easy. Excellence isn't easy. Paul is, is trying to help the Philippians understand, look, there are people at, at this time, there were people who were in the early church who were trying to convince newly converted Gentile Christians that they needed to be especially Jewish about things because, after all, God had chosen and blessed the Jews. So, therefore, since Jesus was a Jew, we all needed to be much more Hebraic. And Paul writes, um, no, not really. Look, I have had lots of fleshly reasons to be proud. Um, I have confidence in the flesh that he mentions. There, this group of people thought that God loved them because of who they were, and they had ticked off all of the right boxes. Now, I don't know if you've ever encountered anybody like that. Um, as you go, hopefully not in the mirror. But that ideal of wanting to check off all of the right boxes, I'm not a huge list guy, but even I get that. I, I, I understand the appeal of that. And Paul is trying to help the Philippians see that that doesn't necessarily work. Verse 6 talks about how he did all the right things, persecuting the church, and for as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. He did all the right things in his own eyes. It is so easy to serve God with rules that we make up. Now, this might be a little bit late in the year. Where this part of the sermon should probably be preached is right around New Year. When we all start thinking about resolutions. I'm going to get up every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. And if you already get up at 6 o'clock, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'm going to pick some fill-in-the-blank crazy early time. And I'm going to do fill-in-the-blank whatever you feel that you're supposed to be doing. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to garden. I'm going to sleep in and dream about exercising and gardening is what the truth is. That idea that I'm going to make a set of rules and I'm going to stick to them and today, uh, today begins the new diet when I'm losing weight for the rest of the year or whatever. We like to make up our own rules and then consider ourselves to be good people if we keep them. This is not the point. Verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Don't compare yourself to others. Instead, compare yourself to Christ himself. And some of you might now be thinking, now wait a minute, Pastor, if I could compare myself to Jesus, I'm going to look rotten every time. Yep, that is the point. Because Christ's righteousness is laid on us. We talked about that a little bit last week. <clears throat> That brings me to the next point. Let's look at verse 8 through 11. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, to attain the resurrection from the dead. We're not competing for God's love. We can't earn God's acceptance and we're not competing for God's love. Verse 8, this phrase about loss and rubbish. Frankly, I don't want to get too into this, but the word that Paul uses um, is an intentionally vulgar term. If you have a King James Bible, you'll see that that word there is dung. Animal droppings. 
Cut, cut. This is icky stuff. I consider all of the wonderful, great, amazing things that I could do in my own strength to be the stuff that I scrape off the bottom of my shoe if I've been walking around where animals have been lurking. And I know that's disgusting. And Why are you preaching about that? Because here it is in Scripture. Paul has all kinds of words that he could have used, and he chooses to use a word that is intentionally vulgar. When we translate it, we've, we've sanitized it. Dung doesn't sound too bad. Rubbish sounds even, oh, that's detrious. That's stuff that's found, no, this is gross. And that's really the point of it. Taking pride in our good works is like taking pride in something that we've stepped in. Not what God wants. Verse 9 contrasts that with the faith of Christ. Now, here's the thing. We go from two extremes. One extreme is this intense, gross word that's compared with our good works. And then contrast that with faith. Now, in our NIV translations, uh, look at verse 9 once again closely. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which comes from the law, but that which is through faith, in Christ, right? Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to get way too deep into this because there are lots and lots and lots of scholarly articles that are written about this. But faith in Christ is the idea, this is called an objective uh, faith. Jesus did his work and we can trust in it and those people who trust in him are going to gain and those people who don't aren't. However, that's not the only way to translate this verse. It's, it's not my favorite way. If you look at, oh, I think King James does this. Um, the, the new uh, English translation does this. They make a, a big deal about this. Instead of faith in Christ, it's faith of Christ. Christ. That's called the subjective. And instead of us placing our faith in something that Christ has done, we're recognizing that Jesus did what he did because of his faith, because of his choice. And frankly, that takes us out of the equation altogether. And I think that's a better translation here simply because it draws a much greater difference between our good stuff, which is really awful stuff, and Christ's good stuff, which is perfect, complete. So if we just mentally talk about faith, which is uh, righteousness, which comes through the faith of Christ, the righteousness that Christ himself has demonstrated, that makes a big difference. Um, if, in fact, if you were to keep your thumb here, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. We're in Philippians, General Electric Power Company, so Ephesians is one book back towards Genesis. We'll look at Ephesians 3, 12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Once again, the NIV is very consistent. When they come across this particular phrase, they want to uh, translate it objectively. But the same phrase is, is, they want to translate it objectively. But the same phrase is subjective in all of these places. It's also the same way in, uh, let's see, Romans 3.22, that it is God's faith, that it is Jesus' faith in action which changes us. So going back to Philippians. And the reason why that's such a big deal <clears throat> in verses 10 and 11 is because Paul wants, and hopefully we do too, to go beyond wearing Christ's righteousness like a cloak. He mentions this a number of times in the New Testament where we are to put on Christ's 
likeness, uh, how we are to put on Christ's righteousness. But now here's the thing. I don't know if you are like this or not. Have you ever put on a pair of pants that are just a little too tight for you? You wear them all day. You take them off. You look down at your waist, and what do you see? The indentations from the pants, right? They, they have made an actual mark on your body. They have shaped you. Now, that seems to be an uncomfortable thing. And you, you look at it, I know that when I do that, and I see that in the mirror, like, okay, really need to lay off the carbs for a while. Instead of a temporary thing, I know if I had the opportunity, if I could go to Nordstrom and buy a pair of size 32 pants that if I could somehow get snapped, that I would actually become a size 32 and stay that way. Wouldn't you buy those pants? If you could buy a, a suit, a, a dress, that actually made your body conform to what the ideal image was, wouldn't you buy that? You, all of the work that you normally would think that you would have to do to get yourself in shape would be gone. That's the point. Paul is saying he wants Christ's righteousness to change him. To not just put this on and change what he's like on the outside, but to change him through and through to mold him. That we would take Christ into our own souls, his faith into us, and that we would become the same kind of people that Jesus is. Excellence isn't easy. Acceptance isn't earned. We do not do good things in order to make God think well, that kid is awesome. I just love that one. No, God loves us consistently no matter what. We can never sin so much that God will stop loving us. We can't do so many good things that God will love us more than he has already demonstrated through Christ on the cross. God loves you. Done. Done. And... I did not grow up hearing that. That's a powerful statement, especially to communicate to a young person, to somebody who's new in faith. God loves you no matter what. Ed, you cannot screw this up. That's pretty great. Because I could screw up a lot of stuff. But can't screw this up. Hallelujah. Talk about good news of the gospel. <coughs> truth for godly training excellence isn't easy acceptance isn't earned and the last one we're going to see verses 12 13 and 14 not that i have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect but i press on to take hold of that for which christ jesus took hold of me brothers i do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Our arrival hasn't occurred. Our arrival hasn't occurred. We have not made it. We're not completed monuments. We are under construction. So part of that is wonderful news. Part of that I realize is frustrating. They always say, especially in the summer, that the shortest distance between two points is always under construction. Sometimes watching the construction is very frustrating, especially when it's inconveniencing you. One of the great joys I had when we were living in the parsonage was watching the houses being built right across the street. I could sit on the porch of the parsonage and it was like HGTV live. I was just watching this house go up. It was great. 
Well, now there's a Dollar General being built uh, a block and a half, and it has blocked the streets that I use all the time. And well, now it's inconvenience. And I was really excited about Dollar General getting here until they started inconveniencing me. Now I have to go around. The issue is that things under construction take time. And you and I are under construction. We have not been finished yet. The perfect here means complete. We're not complete yet. We're not finished. God is still working with us. So keep going. Keep going. I know it's frustrating to drive through roads that are under construction. Don't stop. That's, that's the worst thing you could do. It, it just makes it work, worse for everyone. Keep going slowly, carefully, at the correct speed, right, Chief? Got to make sure you're driving where you're supposed to, but keep going. Verse 13, don't let past missteps trip you up now. Forgetting what lies behind me and reaching for what lies ahead. We have to get past the past. Keep going and get past the past. And the goal, verse 14. This word, the goal. <clears throat> this is the only place in the New Testament where we find this word. It's skopas. Uh, most of the time when we, when we see skopas in the New Testament, it's attached to something episcopos, episcopos, to, to look over something. Um, but scopos, the, set, the, the thing itself, is, is the mark, is the, the thing that you're looking at to determine. So if you are running a race, um, a, a long distance race even, how do you know when you're done? Well, you, you cross the finish line. Well, we even say it there, a finish line, a, Line drawn on the ground. That word line, that's what the word here is, skopas. We are to keep the end goal in mind. Keep that in sight and run towards it. The marked finish line. And so we keep going, we get past the pass, and we run to win. We run to win. But here's the thing. We're not competing against each other. I don't have to go faster than the guy next to me. I'm competing against the course. When I was in basic training, long, long time ago, I was never the fastest guy. This is not a shock to anyone. But I wasn't the slowest guy either. I was probably in the back third most of the time. And I would watch, and there were guys who had to be first. They, they had to be first. And when we started running together as a unit, as a group. The guys who always had to be first would cross the, the finish line and then they thought they were done and they'd throw themselves down on the ground and pant and breathe and, and relax. And I heard the sergeant look at these guys and go, so selfish. Like, what do you mean selfish? He finished the race and it got through to these guys and they started once they would pass the finish line then they would turn around and run to the back of the race where the slowest guy was and they'd run alongside the slowest guy encouraging him a little faster come on you could do this let's go a little bit more that is leadership where you do what you're supposed to do yes and then you turn around and you encourage other people to do what they're being called to do as well. We're not competing against each other. We're competing all together against the course, against this world in which we've been placed. Run to win. Finish. Keep going. And I know there's days when you feel pretty strong and you've been running this race of life and all right, I'm, I'm doing good. And then there are other days when you know you feel like you're in the back of the pack and this is a tough day. Keep going. You got this. God is calling you to finish. 
And as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the completer of our faith, we know that the end of the race is in sight. I don't know how long that's going to be. When I counsel young people who are coming to me for marriage counseling, I remind them, hey, you know, um, 50 years is not uncommon in marriage. You could do 50 years, but you're living in the 21st century. There might be gene therapy or nanobots or some kind of weird tech I don't even know of. You could be married for the next 150 years. Are you planning for that? And their eyes get real big. Plan, plan to last, run to win. We are not finished with God because he's not finished with us. Let's pray. Lord, what a message of hope for us to hold on to, that you are not done, that you are still working with us. Forgive us for the times when we lose sight of that, when all we want to do is stop the race and stand there and look down at our feet and saying it's too tough and here you come the very first one across the finish line coming back for us saying come on come on daughter come on son you've got this keep going i'll run with you you say and lord god we pray for so many of our acquaintances and friends and sometimes family members who think that they're just trapped in a rat race and that there's no one cheering them on because they're not running for you. They're just running. Show yourself to them. Reveal yourself as the end, as the goal, the finish line, and draw us to run for you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.